Okay. So welcome to the local workforce development area leadership office hours calls. And as I say that, I realize I did not change the title on my PowerPoint presentation. So I will get that fixed for next time. I, I apologize for the confusion. So what had happened, I had sent a new invitation to everybody, which you must have found because you're here. So thank you. Um, at the same time that it, the old meeting invitation actually got duplicated and resent to everybody. So I know that there was some confusion, but going forward, we are gonna be using the reoccurring meeting request for local workforce development area leadership office hours calls every two weeks. Um, and the reason that I did that is this, we are really approaching a point where we have seven out of the nine local workforce development areas have been certified, which is fantastic. We just have um, really not that much more to go to get the other two certified. So we're really close. And if you all as CEOs that are on the call remember from the very beginning when we started training, we mentioned that, you know, right at the beginning to set up this sort of foundation for local workforce development area governance, you all have a big place, big part to play. But as the local board gets put into place, um, much of the responsibility really shifts to the local board um, and therefore also their staff and really away from you all. And you become that final oversight uh, of the, the system and, and the board that you put into place to really operationalize what you want your local workforce system to look like. So I thought it was a good time for us to add local workforce development board directors to this call, as well as the staff to the board who have been on the call all along pretty much as they've been added in. So um, really this will become a little bit more generic and not so specific to the CEO roles and responsibilities, but really what the workforce area uh, should be focusing on going forward. So that's, that's the reason for the shift in the call. Um, we have a couple of specific things to join, uh, to go over today. And I have a couple of guest speakers that will be joining us in a little bit. So let's just get started. You all have my email address. Um, just as a quick reminder, and again, I was so worried about putting the content in, I forgot to update these first few slides, but in general, we're here to be able to provide technical assistance and also just offer, offer an opportunity for you all as peers to work together across the state um, with your fellow CEOs, local board chairs, staff to the board, and and really everybody just have a chance to bounce ideas off of each other and, and learn from each other. So today what we're gonna be covering is ticket to work funding. So hopefully you all received an email from me. I believe I sent it out Monday morning regarding ticket to work. And it was, it was a very high level overview because one email does not do justice to the ticket to work program and the nuances of it. So I've invited Brian Dennis today who is a new member of our team in workforce services, but has a lot of experience working with the Ticket to Work program. So he's going to give you some more in-depth, detailed information about that. Um, I'm also going to go over our plans for program year 20 WIOA monitoring. And then I'll also give you an update on the funding because I just got some more information last night. So let's go ahead. Um, as you remember, here's that key CEO key deliverables timeline. Uh, I think probably by the next call, we will have updated this chart to show you what the next key deliverables are, and it will be the responsibility of the local boards most likely to take care of those things. So um, just one last kind of final look together as this, that all of those deadlines, everyone I think is pretty much on pace to meet, which is phenomenal. And the one deadline that we did remove was the requirement to procure a one-stop operator by December 31st. So that deadline has been pushed back. Now, if your local area feels confident in going ahead with that, you're more than welcome to do so, but it's not a requirement at this time. So keep going here. So the first thing we're gonna do is start with the Ticket to Work program. And before I bring Brian on to discuss, I just wanted to bring up the email that I sent earlier this week and give you sort of that overview. So the reason that this is a good time to discuss Ticket to Work is that the program year 20 Ticket to Work funds are available to IWD for the state employment network. During program year 20, the state together as an EN earned right around $300,000. And so Brian and another member of my team are currently in the process of figuring out where those tickets were assigned to which local area and, and how much of that $300,000 should be going to each of the local workforce areas that participate in the state EN. And so now is a good time to really educate you all as leadership of the local areas about what ticket to work funds are, 
how they can be used and how you can effectively administer them um, in your local area. Um, and so this is a chart that summarizes the amount of funding that was received last year in PY19 and divvied out across the local areas, depending upon where the tickets were assigned and, and things like that. Um, it also outlines who the fiscal agent was for those funds. So again, um, a good time for you to decide because every year before the funding goes out, you will need to designate, tell us who you want those funds to be given to from a fiscal agent perspective. And, and to be clear, when we're talking about a fiscal agent for Ticket to Work, it's the same function as a fiscal agent for your Title I adult dislocated worker and youth funds, meaning the fiscal agent should have no decision-making ability and how or when the funds are used, um, but you all as a leadership role, possibly through um, the committees and stuff, we'll get into that in a minute, but decide how the funds are used. And then the fiscal agent simply, you know, cuts the check on your behalf. So the fiscal agent for Ticket to Work should work the same way that it does for the other funds that you have. So it might make sense to make those fiscal agents the same, the same group, um, but, it's, but it's your decision, definitely. And so the reason there are no amounts listed for the old region two, 11 or 16 is because they were operating their own, what's referred to as an independent employment network, which is also an option as well. But today we're really focusing on what the state employment network does and, and help you give that overview of the system. So I am gonna move forward and mute myself and let Brian Dennis come on the line and uh, introduce himself and, and explain Ticket to Work to you. Brian? Thanks, Michelle, and uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, so as Michelle said, my name is Brian Dennis. Uh, while I am new to the IWD team of Workforce Program Coordinators, I've worked with Iowa Work slash IWD and in Ticket to Work for about the last eight years on both the local and state level, some grants we've had done. So uh, this is an area that I really enjoy. I'm very weird in that because there's a lot of moving parts the ticket. So my goal with this presentation is to give you a really brief high level understanding of how ticket work, especially the EN or the employment network responsibilities are, as well as to make myself a resource. If you have questions, there are a lot of moving parts into this, especially in how workforce and ticket intersect. So again, I'm strange. I really enjoy this. I could talk about it all day. I will not do that today. Uh, but again, offer myself up as a member of the team as a resource if you have any questions. So first off, what is the Ticket to Work program? So you can see on the slides, uh, it is Social Security's employment program, okay? So what Ticket really is, is that it's Social Security's way of supporting individuals who receive either disability or SSI benefits, and some folks get both, who want to go to work. So every year Social Security does a survey and this survey shows about 40% of the folks who are on disability and SSI benefits actually want to go to work, they're just not sure how. So Ticket is the way of Social Security investing in those folks and showing them how to return to work. To have a ticket, you have to be between the ages of 18 and 64, and like I said before, be on either Social Security Disability or the SSI program. So if you have anyone in your life that is 15 and receives SSI, they're not a ticket holder. They're not at least 18 years old. If you have someone in your life that's 70 years old and they're on SSI, they're also not a ticket holder. They're outside of those age brackets. Ticket is really focused on those working years. It's free and it's voluntary. There's no cost for the services. And this is where the money comes into it. People who are on ticket, we use the term ticket holder for those customers, by them not only moving to work, but maintaining employment, they earn incentive payments by meeting certain milestones. So as you see in the PowerPoint, we have that link list uh, in the blue. That actually can take you to, if you're curious, to a link that shows you how much an individual receives when it comes to incentive payments, how much they earn when it comes to incentive payments. While the incentive payments are generated by the individual, so if Michelle is our ticket holder, Michelle's work and her and her wages generates those incentive payments. The payments, though, are have to receive by the employment network that she has her ticket assigned to. And we'll talk a little bit more about that here in a moment. And the real overarching guidance 
from Social Security on what is to be done with those funds is to be used for the employability of a person with a disability, not necessarily a ticket holder. Sometimes there's some confusion with that. While ticket holders generate the funds, the funds are really meant to be used for the employment and reemployment of a person with a disability. Some of those folks may be ticket holders, some of those folks may not be, but it's really to invest in the individual or individuals and move them back to work. Next slide, please. So what actually is an employment network? I've thrown that term around a few times. Here's what an employment network is. There are, there are organizations that can accept a ticket and there's a lot of work on the front end to become an employment network, okay? So there's several employment networks in our community. Folk we have is an employment network. There may be some nonprofits that are employment network and I work for development as well as other partners are an employment network. We are Iowa State Workforce Partners is the name of our employment network. What the EM is responsible for is serving the ticket holders, okay? That is the most important job, which is why that's in bold. It's helping individuals take whatever steps they need to move to employment and to maintain that. You also, though, have to check some boxes because Social Security is a bureaucracy. We're familiar with that, right? And so you have to create Social Security approved plans, which include um, goals, routine contacts, how you're going to document uh, the services, supports you're going to provide. You have to respond to Social Security monitoring and file reviews. They will do this uh, a few times during the year is monitor your case plans, your documentation, the work that you're doing with individuals, and there's various other administrative responsibilities that come with running an employment network. Next slide. So in our current structure, IWD is the end for most of your local workforce development areas. Uh, Michelle talked earlier, there are a few uh, areas in the state that have independent ENs, but the vast majority of Iowa is covered by the IWD uh, EN. So through the America's Job Centers, through our offices, customers are served in case managed. That's where we do their documentation, where we do a lot, of, a lot of their enrollments, how we outline their services and supports. And then IWD is responsible for all the administrative duties. So responding to, and when I mean IWD, I get the feeling Michelle means me. Okay, so we're responsible for responding to any and all monitoring that Social Security does when it comes to the ticket program. Uh, there's some routine reporting that needs to be done. Uh, suitability, which is because um, with Social Security Disability SSI, the ticket program, there's a lot of confidential information, even more so that we deal with because of this program. So all the staff have to maintain what's called suitability, which is um, a lot of um, jumps through uh, hoops when it comes to Social Security. So we have to make sure that every person who is doing ticket has obtained and maintained that suitability and resolve any questions about Social Security. So I like to say Social Security has a really big butt. They like to ask questions, so they need a central contact person to fill all of those questions. So while IWD does all of the administrative work, we understand that the bulk of the work that goes to helping the individual move to and maintain employment is done by the individual with the support of the folks that are working in the field. So because of that, the local heirs get 95% of those incentives dollars. So that goes back to the first slide that Michelle showed you, which was last year's numbers that show of the X amount of dollars that came in for a region, IWT, IWD, excuse me kept about 5% for an administrative purposes, and then the other 95% goes out to the local areas. Next slide. So with that, um, I really want to give kind of a really quick surface overview of the ticket program. Uh, are there any questions that folks may have with what I just talked about or anything relating to ticket? All right, not hearing any. Uh, is Michelle, if you'll go to the next slide. That is my information. So again, there's a lot that comes with Ticket. I think it's a phenomenal program. I think it's one of the best things that our country offers for individuals that have significant barriers to employment. Um, and like I said, I can talk about it all day. So I'm glad I kept myself to only a few minutes. But that is my information. There's my phone number. There's my email address. Feel free to contact me if you have any questions about things that I talked about today or anything else regarding ticket, dis service, uh, disability services, how we can help uh, individuals who are accessing our services through the job centers through our region. So with that, um, I'll turn this back over to Michelle. Thank you, Brian. Um, and one of the things that I will just add is that 
this is a really great source of funding for you all as local workforce development boards to be able to provide um, access to, to program, programs and uh, physical accessibility as well, right? So some examples of things you can use the ticket to funds for would be to, you know, if you needed to install a ramp for wheelchairs at the AJC, mm -hmm. you could use these funds. If you needed to um, be able to help somebody that has a disability get back to work and they exactly. need some sort of assistive technology to be able to do that job, you could purchase that assistive technology for them with these funds. So there are a lot of really great uses in um, the, the real um, intent behind the funds to help people with disabilities be able to um, have effective careers and be able to eventually get off benefits, right? So it, it's a great source of funding. And I think that eventually, and honestly, this came out yesterday in local board training with, gosh, I think Western, I can't keep them straight anymore, but there was someone that was asking about the committees for your local workforce development board. And one of the committees that you'll need to have is a disability access committee. Those are committees that have already been active with the previous boards, but will need to you know, transition into the new nine local workforce development area boards. And um, you know, that might be a great place for you all as a board to decide to give approval of how to use the funds, right? The, the partners working in the AJCs can come together if there's, an ex, there's a need for the funds submit some sort of a form to the, the Disability Access Committee, and then the Disability Access Committee could have approval over how those funds are used. So that's just one thought. We can continue to kind of evolve this process as we work forward, but I, I'd ask Brian to give you that overview today so that when, it, when we do have the final numbers ready for the PY20 funds, you'll be able to, one, designate a fiscal agent that you see fit, and that will allow us to give those funds out to the correct entity for you to be able to use them effectively. So thank you, Brian, for that. Okay, so let me go on to the next section of today's topics, which is about program year 20 uh, WIOA monitoring. So this is gonna be the first time that you've seen this slide. It's hot off the presses. So I will pause here for a minute to let you do this. But as you know, um, we are required by the federal government to monitor annually all nine local workforce development areas. And this is a date that kind of continues to be pushed back and continues to be pushed back. But last year we committed to ensuring that we did comprehensive monitoring of all nine local workforce development areas during program year 20. And that's what we're gonna do. So as you remember, program year 20 started on July 1 of 2020 and runs through June 30th of 2021. So we are gonna be a little aggressive in our timeline to make sure that we get this all in before the program year ends. But this calendar or chart will give you an idea of when your local board will have uh, monitoring completed. Now, I will be emailing this out to everyone so you don't need to frantically write this down or anything like that. And um, I do wanna preface before we get any farther that having an official date for when monitoring will happen in your local area can be a little bit intimidating, I understand. Um, I want to stress how much that we at IWD view monitoring as nothing more than a formal tool for technical assistance. And we very much understand that you all as local boards are still really in your infancy in some areas, especially the areas that just most recently combined and became effective July 1. And to have a full monitoring within the first year of, of your creation is a daunting task. So this is absolutely going to be a baseline year for monitoring. Um, you know, we will complete the full process, which will include a monitoring report with possible best practices, possible areas of concern, possible findings. But that is only intended to help you along your, your road to WIOA compliance and having an effective workforce system in your local area. So. I'm gonna move on from this slide and give you a little bit more detail. So when we complete the, the comprehensive monitoring, there are several steps that are involved. And so the first step will be formal notification to the individual local workforce development area. So initially, either later today or Monday, I will send out um, a document that has that chart from the previous slide and it also has this information in it. So again, no need to frantically write any of this down. Um, that will announce the monitoring to all local areas. Going forward, we will most likely send out that notification 
for program year 21, which will start July 1st of 2021, we'll send out something very similar for the entire program year at the very beginning of the program year. So you'll have a lot of notice um, this year. Again, we're on a little bit of a condensed schedule. Um, and so the first thing that we'll do then after that notice for the whole year goes out is 15 days before we begin monitoring a, a specific local area, there will be specific communication sent to that local area with next steps, dates, and all of those things. Um, then from our end, that, that, that letter might include us asking to gather some documents for you or ask from you, excuse me, or asking where we can locate certain documents, possibly online, things like that. Um, once we get that information, our first step will be to complete a desk review. Um, and we will try to do as much remotely as we can, obviously. Um, and I will say that when it comes to the on-site review for PY20, you know, technically that's intended to be what it is, which is on-site. Obviously, given COVID and everything that's going on, we haven't made a final decision yet of whether we'll truly be on-site or not, but we will still do all of the activities we would normally do during an on-site visit virtually if that's the way that it ends up. So um, part of the desk review, is, there's several pieces to it, but what we're really going to be doing is looking at actual case files through a random sample to determine elig if eligibility was determined correctly um, and also to figure out um, and look at the effectiveness of services, right? This isn't just about, you know, did John Smith get enrolled into the program correctly, but are we effectively serving John Smith and his needs and the needs of the employers of your area and all of those things? So it's the bigger picture look at Title I services as well. Um, we'll also review governance documents in the future when you've had a local plan, we would review your local plan, your local policies, all of those things that help to inform um, the picture of the workforce system in your local workforce development area. Uh, once we complete the desk review, then during the on-site visit, which is obviously scheduled in advance, there are a couple of things that will happen. Every on-site visit will start with an entrance conference um, where we'll come in. It's going to be on the Tuesday of the week that the monitoring takes place, introduce ourselves, give a plan for the, for the next couple of days, answer any questions that need to be happen, and just um, really introduce ourselves and get started. Um, then the monitoring will actually happen. And that really will include uh, several different aspects. First of all, we would do any follow-up to questions that arose from the desk review that was completed. We'll probably do a tour of the AJC. We'll probably ask you to show us the customer flow and the service delivery that you're utilizing in the centers, walk us through that, specifically talk about um, priority of service for veterans specifically, um, make sure that non-discrimination and equal, uh, equal opportunity provisions are being followed. We'll conduct interviews with staff. That could be the board chair, staff to the board, um, the service provider, staff, case managers, customers, you know, the whole kind of gamut. And also probably look at how you use the Iowa Works case management system there in the local area. So all of those things would be accomplished most likely Tuesday afternoon through Wednesday maybe into Thursday morning. And then on the last day, which would be Thursday, there's an exit conference. So we would come together again with the people that were there at the entrance conference, hopefully including the leadership of the local workforce development area um, and give you a high level overview of any sort of potential findings that, are, that were brought up, um, just any potential best practices that were discovered or areas of concern. It's not the official report, but it would just be to give you an idea of what was discovered during the monitoring. Um, after we come home from the on-site visit, then we compile a monitoring report and we have 30 business days to do that and get that back to the local area. And part of the monitoring report would uh, include asking for you to submit a corrective action plan on any findings that were discovered during the monitoring. Um, and then you have time, as the chart says, you have 20 business days of, for within the receipt of the monitoring report to reply to the monitoring report with your corrective action plan. And then we continue really to work back and forth together to make sure that those findings are corrected to, satisfaction, this, to our satisfaction. And it just becomes a back and forth dialogue of any technical assistance or training that you might need to assist you in correcting those findings and getting to the place where they've all been corrected. So 
that is an overview of the monitoring process. I want to pause here and let you ask any questions that you Okay, no, everyone's very quiet today. Um, just to make sure you can hear me, right? I'm not talking to myself. We can hear you. Okay, perfect. Okay, so let's go to the next part. The last thing that I wanna to cover today was an update on funding. So as you know, um, I've been, the, the Title I funding is divided into two pots, the program year funding, which was available July 1st, and then the FY21 or fiscal year funding that was supposed to be available October 1st. Um, as typical, the feds were delayed in making that funding available to the state. Therefore, we have to delay making it available to the local areas. But I did get the notice of award last night. So we are now able to turn around and award the funds out to the local area. So before we do that, I just want to back up and say that um, we have sent out master agreements to all local workforce development areas now so that those should all be in the process of being signed and put into place, which is the master agreement that will allow IWD to pass funds down to the fiscal agent on your behalf. So we'll get those back signed and we'll be ready to go. So now that we have official notice that we have received the FY21 Title I Adult and Dislocated Worker Funds, we will do modifications um, and sort of in the, in the flow that follows on the chart. So the first thing that we'll do is um, several of your local areas who still have contracts between IWD and the service provider directly through December 31st, there may need to be funds added into those contracts so that they can finish out the contract through December 31st. You've sent me that information about how much you want to put into those contracts. So the first step will be to um, execute modifications to put that amount of funding into those contracts. Um, then what I'll do is make sure and calculate to the penny what funds are available and left over that have not been put into contract yet and that will all be put into contract with the fiscal agent. Um, and then from there on out all of the funding that goes down to the local level will be done directly between the fiscal agent and the service provider that's selected through your RFP process. Um, I will be working on those today and hope to get those out very early next week so that you can get that funding available and people can start using it. So um, again, this process has been really a transition year as, we, as we've transitioned to um, correctly procuring the service providers and correctly contracting out the funds. So when we go through this process again for next year for program year 21, First of all, it will happen you know, earlier in the year. So probably around April, hopefully April, May, um, we will be able to be told from the federal government how much the allotments are for the state. We'll go through the allocation process. And for, for next year, for program year 21, there will be no sort of messing around and put this much here and this much here and that much here. IWD will take the full amount that's um, allotted to each local area, put it into the contract with the title, uh, excuse me, with the fiscal agent through a modification of the contract. And then um, the rest of it is a local area decision about how much you keep for you to use at the local board level and how much gets put into the contracts with the service providers. So anybody have any questions about funding? Okay, well, then the last thing that I have is just a couple of next steps. So I think we mentioned this at the last office hours calls as well, but one of the first things that the local boards will be required to do is go through local area performance negotiations with the state. And so what that looks like is um, the, the WIOA key performance measures of which there are six, you have to, we have to establish a goal or a performance level for each local area. I will tell you that I actually had a call with the Department of Labor on Wednesday and I've asked them to push that back for us. So 
Uh, <laughs> while I plan to give some additional information at the next office hour, <laughs> 12 weeks, I, um, I, I'm hoping that I'll be able to have the good news to say we're going to hold off on this right now because I still think that there's more um, training and education that needs to happen before we can make that process successful, both at the state level and the local level, because this is not a process that the state has fully committed to in the past either. So it's not just at the local level. Um, so I will come back with more news on that. And so then the other piece is the local plan. And I know several of you have been asking about this. Good news, the State Workforce Development Board approved policy for local plan requirements at the last board meeting last Friday. So our core partner team met yesterday and they are finalizing getting that guidance out to you, which will include a template for you all to use while you develop your local plan and also a timeline for when those will be due. So I was not at that meeting because I was doing uh, workforce board training. So I'm not sure what they came up with, but I hope to have within the next couple of weeks, some more um, specific guidelines on that for you as well. So, and then one other thing that I didn't add on the slide, but I think is important. And I mentioned it a little bit earlier at yesterday's board training, which I was with Western Iowa, um, the, this notion of committees for the local workforce development board came up. And so I think that that's an area where we can provide you more guidance um, in regards to what committees are required, what other type of committees you may want to consider, who has to chair those committees and be on those committees and all those things. So that's some additional technical assistance that I'm gonna be working on and will hopefully have available to you at the next uh, office hours call uh, in two weeks. So. Those are the next steps that I have. And that's it for today, unless anybody has anything they wanna bring up and discuss. Michelle, uh, Dave Baker from hi, Dave. Uh, hi Northeast Iowa um, yeah. Workforce Area. Uh, we have, I believe, started the process requesting transition funds. Do you have any update on updates on the uh, uh, potential transition funds uh, that are available, when they might be rolled out, that type of thing. Have you sent me a request for that, Dave? I thought Heather did. Okay. Um, um, she, I, yeah. she might have, and it might just be in my inbox. <laughs> oh, I so, know she was requesting uh, information. Maybe I need to check back with her. Okay. Because I haven't actually like sent a letter myself, but I... Okay. Uh, um, uh, so I'll, I'll check with her, but uh, I guess our other uh, areas, uh, have they already received it? If they, yep. re, you know, requested and reached, okay. So we're yep, in that, they have. So we're in that in, process. Okay. okay, perfect. So just so everybody on the call is aware, um, for the local areas that did go through realignment, um, effective July 1st, so that would be Mississippi Valley, South Central Iowa, Northeast Iowa, and Western Iowa. Um, the law allows for us to use statewide set aside funds to help them through that transition um, by providing some additional funding through transition funding. So it is only available to areas that went through a realignment. Um, but yes, for those areas that have requested it, um, Mississippi Valley has already received theirs. Um, the modification to add funding for South Central is being processed as we speak. I know that I received a request from Wayne Miller from Western, which is also in my inbox. So. I'm assuming if Heather asked Dave, I probably haven't and just haven't gotten to it yet, but that's still a possibility and we um, we will definitely work on that with you. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Hi, Michelle, it's Miranda. Hi. Hi. Um, back to the monitoring. Um, will IWD be providing guidance on like policy for the local areas? for performing our local monitoring or any tools to use like the desk reviews? Yes, and I know you've asked me that like 400 times and I have not sent it to you yet, I'm sorry. Um, but we're still in the process of finalizing some of the tools that we will be using. And so as soon as we have those done, we will absolutely push it down to you all as, as a starting off point. And one other thing that I would point everyone to is that if you remember correctly, there is a website called Workforce GPS, and I'll just type it into the chat here if I can type while I'm talking. Um, let's see, GPS, is it .org, Lori, or .com, or .gov? I can't remember. Oh, geez, I don't know. I'll uh, figure it out and I'll put it in the chat before we're done. Um, well, I'll take, I'll do that while okay. you're- Okay, well, 
Yes, since I can't talk and type at the same time. <laughs> this is Brian. This is .org. Is it .org? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Brian. Too many ends. So workforcegps.org is a website that the Department of Labor sponsors and Mayor and Mayor helps often to publish information, to all kinds of technical assistance. Um, and one of the things that's on there, if you go, if you go to the website and you just search for core monitoring guide, um, the Department of Labor has put out, it's a 235 page core monitoring guide, which walks mm -hmm. you through all things monitoring for WIOA. Um, and that is what we will base our monitoring off of. So that's a really good place for you all to start to do your local level monitoring as well. So um, until I can get you anything more specific to Iowa, I would really recommend going out and Googling that core monitoring guide. And um, then we will continue to share tools as they are finished up here locally. Um, and just as a, a plug, that site has a lot of different information on it. So once you go to Workforce GPS, if you've not been there before, you're going to have to register uh, with the site, but it's it's your email address, and then you have to use that to log in each time. But um, there's a plethora of information there, um, and hopefully you would be able to you know find a lot of useful tools um, for literally anything you need to do related to WIOA. I just pulled up the site. Can you all see still see my screen there? Yep, with the Workforce GPS. So yeah, and, and the one really cool thing about this site is that you can go into your profile and you can sign up for different types of programmatic or systematic you know, updates. So for local boards, there's a ton of stuff on here about what does a strategic local board look like and how can they operate? They have um, desk aids and workshops that you can do to help you become an effective local board. There's specific information on you know, adult, dislocated worker, youth, everything you can think of. So, and then Brian, yeah, thanks for putting in that specific um, core monitoring guide link as well. But all I've done here is, and you can see I've looked for it a time or two, is just search for core monitoring guide and it will come up. Um, and this is the one I was thinking about, the DOL core monitoring guide. And you can click on it. And over here on the left, there will be any documents that they have. They also host webinars uh, almost daily that if you sign up for content, let's say about the Trade Adjustment Assistance Act program, if they're gonna have webinars about that, they'll email you and say, hey, you might wanna sign up for this. Um, and then you can watch the webinar live and participate live, or they're always then out posted a few days later in the recorded version of it. So you can come back to it and watch it at any time. So. This is a phenomenal resource for you all from really every aspect of what you're working on right now. And I know I've shared this before, but this gives a nice way for us to sort of look at it. So, yeah. Sorry, Miranda, I'm not ignoring you, I promise. I mean, I kind of am, but only because I'm just trying to prioritize. No, that's fine. I completely understand. So, okay. Any other questions for today? Uh, Michelle, this is Michelle in Southwest Iowa. Hi. Hi. I just had a quick point of clarification on the local plan. Um, you mentioned that soon we should be getting um, the court partners to be finalizing that guidance and sharing a template in the timeline. Um, previously, we had, we had shared, you know, that the local board would be able to provide a general estimate of when they think they would be able to have that completed. Yep. Um, I just curious if there's any other guidance on it yet. Well, so one thing I don't want you to stress out about is that it's going to be quick because we understand that this is something, especially for a board that's meeting quarterly, um, is not something that you can just whip out, you know, in a couple of months. So I can right. tell you that before the, the meeting yesterday, my advice to my team was to have a deadline of, of um, around May 1st for those plans. Because once you, once you all submit the local plan to the state, we have to go through a process to approve it. And unfortunately, it's not a quick process because it involves all four core partner agencies and we have to work together on that. So we need some time. So the May 1st deadline that I sort of threw out there was based on having plans in place for July 1 or program year 21, right? 
So what we're hoping to do is be able to give you as much time as possible to um, create those plans. And so hopefully that gives you a little bit of um, relief so that it's not something that has to be done immediately. And the other thing that I will say is I did mention earlier when we monitor, we'll monitor for your local plan. Obviously we can't do that this year when they don't exist. So that's not something, you know, we're gonna come out and say, you have a finding, you haven't done a local plan. Well, we didn't tell you to, so <laughs> you know what I mean? So we'll work with you on that, obviously. And, um, you know, the other thing that I will always plug is stealing stuff from other people that have already done it. Uh, you know, there are 49 other states that are a little bit farther along in this process. And most of those local areas in those states, I would assume, have a local plan already. Every state's going to give slightly different guidance on what that details and what it should look like. So, but, but going out and doing research on local plans that other local areas have written um, is a great place to start for how you all would, would develop yours and then put that within the guidance that we provide for Iowa. Does that awesome. answer your question? Thank you. Michelle? That's perfect. Thank you so much. Yep. Okay, well, it doesn't sound like there are. So I just want to say again, I apologize for the confusion on the invitation. So if you talk to any of your peers and they mentioned missing the call or, or being confused, the invite that is titled, um, now I need to look at it myself, WIOA LWDA Leadership Office Hours is the one that we will be using for the foreseeable future. I think I scheduled it out through the end of next year, just in case. Um, so that's the one that everyone will want to join. I did include invitations for all CEOs, so all 99 CEOs, local board chairs that I am aware of who they are. So if your local board has elected a chair and I just need to know who it is, let me know and I can get them added. Um, local board staff that I know of, which I think at this point everybody has local board staff, so that's phenomenal. Um, and then if there's anybody else from your local boards, like if you do get to working and you have committee chairs that want to join or just any local board member who wants to join, all you have to do is send me their name and email and I will get them added to the invitation as well. So um, as always, we did record this. So probably Monday, I will have this recording available on the State Workforce Development Board CEO information website so that you can view it later along with the PowerPoint. And I think that's it. So Thank you everyone for joining. I hope you have a great weekend. Happy Halloween. Thank you. And we'll talk in a couple of weeks. Oh, I should show you that. Well, I guess I already changed my next call is scheduled for November 13th, which is a Friday. So we might have to change it. I don't know. Um, and it would be at noon. So, all right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.